thanks for coming. So, so glad that you are all here. Uh, my name is Amy Kranick. I'm a brand ambassador for Sculpey and I'm letting my boss do something real quick. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. And I'm in the Sculpey studio and I'm really excited about today's class. We're going to make a bunch of rings. Isn't that exciting? I, I don't make rings very often, so this is really fun. And we're also going to make a pair of earrings and a trinket dish. And these are all kind of color coordinated to make a really nice gift set that you might want to share with your besties for the upcoming holidays. Um, great way to put together, pull together a little, you know, um, gift giving scenario here with earrings and rings and a little stash disc, dish. So, so happy about that. Uh, we'll get started in just a moment, but I want you to know that if you have technical questions about what I'm doing, process questions, technique questions, um, color questions, you're welcome to put those in the chat and my boss, Jen, um, will be answering those questions. Or if you have a question for me, um, sometimes we can take time out to answer those directly. So without further ado, let's go crafting. Okay, so our set today is based on um, and I'm just gonna touch that little button there, Jen, so this message will go away. I think it's, there it goes. Okay, so today um, the solid clays that we're working with or the oven baked clays comes from this multi-pack of half Primo and half Souple. And that's how I made all these rings. And I did make some accent beads to go with our earrings. So those colors all come in here. There's 24 one ounce bars. It's a great pack for mixing and blending your own custom colors and for mixing those great Primo accent colors with souffle to get so much more happening there. Um, also, we are gonna do some liquid Sculpey on uh, to make these earrings. Um, these are liquid Sculpey cabochons with Heshi beads made out of Primo and souffle. And then we are going to make um, this little dish. This is one of the dishes that I came up with, with just this cool sort of marble looking um, finish. But I also want you to see there's so many ways you could finish one of these and they look really cool. And these were all done with the same basic color patterns. So if I was doing this project at home, I want to take you through what I would do first because the liquid Sculpey elements are gonna go through more than one baking. And so you wanna make sure and get your liquid Sculpey pieces in the oven first. Now this is our cabochon mold and for these earrings um, I have included the medium sized teardrop cabochon in our navy metallic. So I want to show you how to fill the mold and what you need to do after that. Um, I have already stirred all of the liquids that you see me use today. Those have already been stirred and so you you always want to stir your liquid Sculpey kind of like you would do paint before you use it. So I'll just start right in the middle of this medium and you can't see because my hand is blocking. I'll try to hold my hand to the side. Um, I just kind of drizzle my liquid Sculpey right in the middle and let it spread itself. And you wanna fill the mold to level and then we're gonna tap it a few times to release air bubbles. Sometimes I'll underfill the mold just slightly and let it tap and spread. And then I can always go back and add a drip or two. Now, if you see any stubborn bubbles come to the top surface of the liquid Sculpey as you're tapping, you can always go in and pop those with a needle tool. And then after you pop, I want you to tap it again some more. Now this is filled just pretty much to level. I like, I like that. It's not doming over or anything. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's this really cool swirling pattern happening in there. All of our metallic liquids have mica in them and they kind of create like these really neat mica trails, which I think just really lend to the design. So that one is ready to go in the oven. You would want to just set this level on a baking tray. I'm just going to put it right there. And we're going to need two of these because we have two ears and we're going to make two earrings. And so after this one bakes, following the baking instructions for liquid Sculpey. Um, you would wanna let it cool and then you would want to demold that. And I've got one baked here to show you how to demold. 
And after the demolding, which is just gently flexing the, the silicone mold and popping this out, then you would want to do it again so that you'll have two of these liquid Sculpey pieces that are ready to make the earrings. Okay, so at home, that's what I would do first is I would bake um, those cabochon pieces. Next thing I would do is I would skip over to my dish um, project. I'm gonna kind of go back and forth because the dish project goes through more than one baking as well. And so I want to make sure um, that I have like, that I'm being very efficient with my time and that I've got something baking in the oven while I'm working on other parts. So what I wanna show you is how to fill this silicone coaster mold. And this is very flexible. And this was designed to make coasters and I've used and used and used it. It looks kind of dirty, but it's really not. It's just sort of stained. And the first thing we wanna do is produce a gold base um, that will be the support system of our little dish. And then I actually added this marble area after the gold was baked. So I wanna show you how to add the gold in first. This is actually gonna take two bottles, two one ounce bottles of gold liquid Sculpey. And I have already stirred and stirred and stirred this product because this product works best when it's stirred. So to fill this um, silicone mold, what I like to do with the coaster edge is just pull it back like that and then I stick the tip right down in there. Now I have this, um, this tip open full throttle, all the way open, and I'm just gonna uh, put the liquid right down into that deepest groove first. Now there's lots and lots and lots of silicone molds on the market. This is sort of a frosty clear one. Um, I'm sure you noticed our cabochon mold is a dark gray color. Um, there's other silicone molds that are like bright pink and some are teal green. And you really need to inspect the package when you go to buy a mold and make sure it's silicone. Um, the color might be a giveaway that it's silicone, but also you wanna read the packaging because silicone is very heat resistant. And we need that because all of our products are gonna go in the oven to cure. So we need that heat resistance. And you might find molds, um, you can find molds on sculpey.com. You can find molds um, in Michael's and in Michael's, you could look in the craft section and in the baking section, because there's a lot of fondant molds that work really well with liquid Sculpey too. Okay, for now, I've only filled this rim and I wanna show you um, what I like to do at this point to release air. So the favorite place for air bubbles to get trapped is gonna be right here along this nice edge. That is where air bubbles are gonna wanna stay. And we do not want that. So what I do is I take a needle tool and I go, I dip into the, silicone uh, mold and through the liquid Sculpey. And I point the tip of my needle tool at that little edge. And I just run the tool all the way around the edge very gently. I'm not digging into the surface of the mold. I'm just dragging it along, releasing the air that might be trapped in that corner. Okay, and I need to wipe this off. Okay. Now, if you look closely at this, I'm calling this a corner, this is the outer corner, and then there's a corner here too, the inner corner, and that place wants to hold air bubbles trapped as well. So this time I'm gonna dip my uh, needle tool into the liquid and drag it along the inner edge. Now you can't see the air bubbles coming up, but I've done this so many times that I just needed to come up with a way to release those hidden air bubbles. And I can tell you nine times out of 10, if there's gonna be an air bubble, that's where it will land. And we just don't want that. We want the edges of our liquid to be super clean and crisp like they're supposed to be. All right, now that we've done that, we wanna go back and fill the whole mold. So what I do is I just go into the center here and I just let it rip. If you wanted to, you could just take let me scoot my hand out of the way so you can see what I'm doing. I'm just basically piling it up in the middle. And if you wanted to, you could take the lid off. Let's do that too. Just show you what it looks like. Just take the lid completely off and just dump it in. I may have squirted out quite a bit already. 
So this um, coaster mold, I feel it works best um, in my projects if I get it pretty full. Um, you can make it thinner, like um, this one is quite a bit thinner. I didn't go as full as I did, um, let's say on this one. This one, I filled it almost all the way up. So if we compare these two, the gold and the blue, you can see that the blue is just quite a bit thicker and it just kind of makes a whole nicer, nicer project. Okay, that one's about empty. So I'm just gonna open another one and show you how full I want this to be. I want this outer edge of the rim, I want that to be at least halfway full, if not all the way full. So I'm gonna go in here with another bottle of the gold and these are one ounce bottles. I'm just letting it spread itself and you can kind of see the air bubbles popping as we go. And then I would actually go in here with a tool and try to pull some of that extra out. Hey, Amy, while yes. you're doing this, um, mm -hmm. can you just talk a little bit about <clears throat> baking in your home oven versus the toaster oven? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so at, in my home, in, in my home studio, I do both. I have a toaster oven that's dedicated to oven baked clay. It's a Hamilton Beach toaster oven that I just leave set on 275, which most of our clays bake at. And um, toaster ovens are pretty um, reliable, I feel, and um, actually have two of them. I have one set at 275 and I have one set at 300 because um, our liquid Sculpey bakes at 300. Um, and the Hamilton Beach one is a very nice size. It allows for fairly large projects and also allows for fairly deep projects. But if I have a really, really, really big project, I am not afraid to put that in my kitchen oven. Um, I love my kitchen oven as well because it's very accurate and I can just set the temperature exactly where I want it. And it also has a reliable timer. So time and temperature are super important. So whether you're using a convection uh, craft oven or a kitchen oven, the first thing you need to do is get to know that oven really well by letting an oven thermometer live in there for a while and just get to know that you can actually trust the temperature and the time that your oven claims to be. Um, if you find consistently that your oven runs hotter or colder than it should, you're gonna need to make adjustments and take some notes because um, Oven baked polymer clays work best when they're cured at an accurate time and accurate temperature. So either one is fair game. Um, it's also important to use, if you're using a kitchen oven, um, you probably wanna buy some cheap or inexpensive baking pans that can be just for your clay projects. Um, all of our clays are completely non-toxic, but um, uh, it's still not gonna help your cooking taste any better. <laughs> So you might want to just invest in some like craft dedicated um, pans that you can put the clay onto. Otherwise, if you have to rely on your baking pans, you could protect those with parchment or foil or even sheets of paper could be a barrier between your clay and your pan. So um, that's just the best way to make sure that whatever you're crossing over between craft and baking, you really don't want to mix those too much. Um, so, you know, figure out what works best for you and invest in some cheap, some cheap baking pans. Okay, I don't know if you can see some of the bubbles, but they are coming up. And this is the Zen part of the practice where you just get to tap and tap and let your mind <laughs> wonder. Amy, can you talk about why you're tapping? Someone yes. asked if they could do the Kikan or alcohol to release. Oh, bubbles. and um, no, you cannot. And I know that in resin, because uh, I share my art, my art studio with a resin artist, uh, my daughter, she can use um, heat gun to release air bubbles. That does not work well for us. Um, alcohol also does not work well for us because um, spraying alcohol at liquid Sculpey will actually may change the sub substance of the liquid Sculpey and make it lumpy and bumpy. So we tap to release air bubbles. That's also why I went around the outside. Remember when I went like this and I put it right down in that edge and I put it in the inner edge as well. That helps release air bubbles. Um, 
we kind of need to release our air, air bubbles the old fashioned way. You can't use a heat gun because that's going to sort of start the curing process with oven baked clay. And you can't use alcohol because that will change the chemistry of the oven baked clay. So we tap and tap and tap and tap. And sometimes on a big thing like this, if you can leave it for a half an hour or so before it goes in the oven, you'll see the air bubbles naturally come up and then you can release those by tapping. All right, I wanna show you a cool trick I like to do. Uh, this is a baked piece of that gold. And you do see that it gets quite a bit richer in color when it's baked. But this is the bottom of my art piece. So this is gonna be the bottom of my dish. And uh, since our gold has all this beautiful mica in the liquid, I like to distribute that mica with a swirling pattern because that, when it bakes, that mica gets really, really deep in color. And it actually, the swirl that I'm creating with this tool actually will show up and it'll just make the bottom of your, of your piece look so finished. So you may not be able to see the mica swirls all that much right now, but you will really see it like this after it's baked. So when I get to the middle, I'm just gonna gently lift this straight out and let the drip go straight down. I don't wanna fling the drip um, outside my pattern, so. And even after you've swirled it, you can keep tapping. I see, I see some stray bubbles. You can pop bubbles with your needle tool if you want, okay? Now this needs to go in the oven so that it's baked before we put the design inside. So I wanna give you a little baking tip that I've come up with after years and years of sampling with liquid Sculpey. So sometimes, depending on what the mold is made out of and how thick the mold is, if there's thinner parts to the mold or parts of the mold that come closer into contact with the pan, this part of the mold is like raised creating this um, air buffer under this part while this part of the mold comes in direct contact with the hot pan and with the heat. I've found that this mold bakes a little inconsistently. And sometimes when I go to get it out of the oven, it'll have an air bubble right here because this part of the mold um, baked at a different rate than this part. So this is what I've come up with to make that not happen. I would take, um, here's my baking pan, and I would take either a hot pad like this one, which is oven safe, or I would fold up a um, dish towel and get it completely wet. And then I will roll this up and squeeze all the extra water out. Then I'll put that down and I'll put my, my item to be baked, my silicone mold right on top of it. Now, believe it or not, as that water um, steams off, it kind of cools the mold down to a point where every part of the mold seems to cook at an even rate. And it avoids, it totally eliminates that huge air bubble pocket that might happen in an uneven heat distribution. So this works really well with all kinds of molds. And so I just wanted to put that out there that if you have trouble with your, your silicone molds warping or anything like that, you can always bake on a damp pad and that will um, take care of that problem. Also, um, you might wanna extend your baking time by five to 10 minutes because this is gonna actually cool things down the, the dampness of the pad. So you could give it a little extra time. Okay, so these are ready to go into the oven and then I'll show you what we do when they come out. So I've already showed you how to demold um, the little cabochons. And if you weren't here earlier, I had pre-baked two of these um, medium-sized teardrops and then you just flex the mold to take it out. Now, sometimes um, we have a little challenge of deciding how in the world we're gonna get some holes in this and how we're going to finish that. So I've come up with a tip for that and I wanna show you that to you. And um, I might need to back up just a bit and show you what to do with your solid clays as well. I don't wanna skip any steps and I'm just about to skip a step. Okay, so this earring design um, finishes with these little Heshi beads and they're just flat spacer beads that we decided to incorporate as design elements on the sides. So I'm gonna show you how I did that. And I need just a bit of my souffle in, um, I think this is sea glass, just equal parts of sea glass and igloo. 
So just equal amounts. And I just want to marble these together. So I'm gonna condition them real quickly. And um, Jen, just so I make sure I'm doing well, can you give me a time check? 221. 221, okay, I think we're doing fine. Wanna make sure we can get all those rings at least demoed, all, all the different styles, at least one of each style. So that's gonna take a minute or two. <laughs> okay, so these are conditioned pretty well. Now I'm just gonna shape these um, to basically the same size. Little logs, we just need some little logs. Now I'm sure everyone out there has their favorite method for marbling clay and that's all I'm talking about is marbling some clay. So just starting and making a little twist. Here's a tip for you. See how that white is bulging and moving? That's because that white was a little bit, that's actually igloo. The igloo was a little softer and it wants to move faster than the sea glass. So there's some, um, it's just good to know the personalities of your clays and of your colors. And, um, you know, sometimes you don't want, you want your clays to be exactly the same consistency and you might want to leach some of the plasticizer out of that igloo clay so that it becomes stiffer like the sea glass. But for marbling, I feel that is really not an issue. So I'm basically just working up some twists, folding it in half folding it again. And all this folding and folding does is um, create more and more twisting. More and more stripes. You can also do this method with scrap clays. And I feel that scrap clay gives you absolutely the best yield of super cool marbling and stripes because it's a lot less controlled and you might have different colors in your scraps that kind of work in together. So great way to use up scrap clay is to marble it. Okay, it's gonna do this again, at least one more time, fold and fold until we get it real, real, real stripey. Real, real, real stripey, okay? <laughs> random, random stripes, okay. So now what we can do with that is we can use it to make a backing for our cabochon area. And we're also gonna use this to make the Heshi beads. So first let's talk about how you back these cabochons. So since these pieces are solid and they have no hole in them, I needed to get a little bit creative about how I wanna connect my findings to these. How am I gonna get a hole in here? So what I decided to do was to sandwich my finding between the, the baked liquid Sculpey and this uh, marbled clay here. So I'm just gonna take off a little bit of this and I'm gonna form this into a little teardrop patty um, that I know I can spread out. So here's my size and shape. And what I wanna be able to do is I wanna flatten that into a little pancake on the back of the liquid Sculpey cabochon. But first I'm gonna balance this little guy, which is my earring finding on the back. And then I'm gonna grab it and sandwich it with this um, souffle clay. And then I'm gonna gently mush my souffle clay out toward the edges and see how I've got that that finding trapped in there, that's a really good way to do it. So I've made sure to make the back decorative. You could also use like gold clay here instead, one of our colors that complements our rings. Um, you could even use um, some of this twinkle twinkle would be nice that comes in the kit. Um, that is a good color to complement the navy metallic. You could have backed it with that. And then this needs to be baked again. So I'll just set that aside on the pan. And then we wanna do that all over again. I'm gonna take the other end here of this. I'm gonna make another teardrop shape like so. So when I make a teardrop, I just roll, first I roll a ball in the center of my hands. Then I kind of put pressure on one side and that forces a point to appear on the edge of the ball. So again, we wanna balance this little earring finding right here and then capture it with the clay. Okay, and just keep 
moving that clay out to the edges. I don't want it to wrap around the front at all. I just want it to be an interesting backing. Because, you know, a lot of times, especially if you have short hair, people are going to see the back of your earrings and they might as well look nice. So I think that's a good way to do it. And it incorporates the finding. So bake that again, following the baking instructions for souffle. And here's another good tip. Um, for these, if you don't want them to lay right on the baking pan, you can balance them in this mold. And that will keep the surface of the clay that's already baked off of your baking pan. And it, it'll make a nice it won't change you know, the surface of that pre-baked clay. So sometimes I use my molds as a little prop like that. Okay, let's talk about how we made the Heshi beads now. So um, Heshi beads, like I said before, are just spacers. And Jen and I decided to make these Heshi beads kind of uh, out of the marbled clay. So they have like a little stripe detail to them. And first I wanna start with a piece of clay that is um, bigger in diameter than my Heshies are. These Heshi beads are probably about at least a quarter of an inch in diameter. So I want this piece of clay to be wider than that. And I'm just gonna cut off a little section that's manageable. Then you need to take a wire or um, a piece of, this is a piece of metal that's a very heavy wire, it's real stiff. Um, you could use your edge and pearls, but I don't like to because it might mark them when we go to cut the bead and I'll show you that. Um, so a heavy gauge wire, like maybe 12 or 14 is pretty thick wire. That'll work, just something super straight and stiff. And what I'm gonna do is put this wire all the way through this lump that I took off of my marbled um, rope, like so. Okay, I'm gonna put it that right in the middle of the wire. Then I'm gonna roll this, making it more the diameter that I want it to be. I want it to be a little bit thinner than this. So as I roll, it is spreading out on the wire. And it's so genius because it is um, keeping a hole through all of that. This is already pierced. So whoever invented this, I thank you. I don't know who did it, but it's a great method for making spacer beads. Now I'm gonna take a sharp blade and the first thing I'm gonna do is take this scrap off because I that's not gonna make a pretty bead. So using a rolling cut, I'll just eliminate this, this odd piece from the end. And then I'm gonna eliminate this odd piece from this end. Now, as you make a rolling cut, um, what happens is, as the blade goes through the clay, it goes through fairly evenly. And when it gets to the wire, it obviously stops cutting. And that's why you wanna make a rolling cut to make sure it's cutting all the way through. Now I'm, I am spacing these about an eighth of an inch or a fat eighth, I'd call it. And this is, I'm just moving my blade over and doing that rolling cut until it hits the wire and then I'm moving over again and making that rolling cut. My clay is kind of warm and it's really wanting to stick to my work surface. So that's why sometimes I'm having a little trouble, but if you could let your, your marble clay rest a bit, um, it will just glide back and forth. And this is the part where I said, you might not really want to do this on your etch and pearls, although you'll be tempted to because your blade could actually mark um, you know, the surface of your tool, so. Okay, I don't need that many, so I'm gonna stop cutting there. So this is cut every eighth of an inch, and I'm gonna bake it on the wire, just like this, here, <laughs> okay? Even though they're touching together, you don't have to spread them apart, you just leave them on there like that and bake them. And that bakes following the baking instructions for souffle. Okay, next let's talk about what you would do when they come out and they're cool. So this is a series of Heshi beads that have already been cut and baked. And so the first thing you wanna do is get it off the wire. And you might need to kind of twist a bit. There it goes. Now don't do this on coated wire because the plastic coating will stick to the beads. Also don't do it on a wooden skewer. That does not work. You're, you can email me and ask me how I know that. But anyway. <laughs> So there you go, you've got this big long bead with 
a hole all the way through it. Now, this is also a great way to make tube shaped spacer beads without making the cuts. You can make these beautiful spacer beads. Okay, now that you have it like this, you just can break these apart right on the line, right on the cut lines. And this one's not very long. I don't have a lot of leverage. So if you can't break them, then just put your, your uh, blade right in there and just slice them right on your cut line. And look how beautiful and even these little spacer beads are, or Heshi beads. And we really only need like six of them to create, or no, we need, uh, we actually need 12 to create our earrings. So I'll show you how I put the earrings together. Okay, so you wanna just cut all those apart and there you have it. Those are ready to construct. All right, I'm gonna take this earring apart so I can show you what I did. So this type of finding, these come in lots of lots of metal colors. Um, sometimes they come with this little hook already in them. You can see that little, that little um, 90 degree hook. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes they come straight across. And so I'm gonna take this gold one, I'm gonna bend this gold one. This gold one I actually bent. So I'm gonna bend it back flat and show you that's how it actually came to me was with a flat bend. So I'm gonna unwork this one so I can show you how I did it. I've got some tiny navy colored seed beads cause that matches um, our, our color really well. And so remember this was baked inside in between, just like we did this one, it was baked between the souffle and the liquid Sculpey cabochon. And uh, when it came out of the oven, it was a little bit difficult to pull out because this is curved. And so it, you just take your time and gently pull it out and then you can string it right back in. And then I have, the only reason you have to take it apart is so that you can add the decorative beads on the side. So I finished it with um, a series of seed beads and Heshi beads, just like so. And then I threaded the um, wire right back through and then repeated the design um, on the other side. It's a seed bead and a Heshi and a seed bead and a Heshi and a seed bead, spacer bead, seed bead. Okay, now uh, what I wanna do, I think they're easier to wear this style earring if you do have that little um, 90 degree bend on the end. And I just take a pair of flat nose pliers and bend that right up. I hope you can see that little hook I'm talking about that I just bent because that helps you capture that little loop that's on the other side. And there you go. You just need to repeat um, for two of these. And there's our finished pair of earrings. All right, now let's move back to our dish. Um, let's pretend that this is the one that I poured earlier and put in the oven. And so to demold it, you just flex the mold and pull it right out. And it looks really, really pretty and neat. There's no air bubbles because of that air bubble release trick that I showed you with the needle tool. It's really finely done. And um, the back is super pretty too. Now, sometimes Liquid Sculpey likes to climb up the edge of any silicone mold. And so I just take a sharp pair of craft scissors and I just remove that edge because I don't want that rough edge on there. I want my, I want my artwork to look beautiful and finished in, from all angles. So I'm just trimming that piece right off. Just letting my scissors ride right along that edge. It's really not difficult. It's sticking right up. And there we go. Beautiful. And it helps your little dish, you know, sit really nice and flat too. Okay, so now we want to put a design in here. And the design that Jen and I liked was like this marbled, it almost looks like, you know, organic marble that um, comes out of the earth. And so that's the look we were going for. So that is white and silver and a, just a little bit of gold liquid Sculpey and very few tools. So I want to show you how I did that. So first I've already stirred and stirred and stirred and stirred my white liquid Sculpey. And I'm just gonna add some of this. I've got my tip all the way open 
And I'm going to add this in just really an organic pattern. And what I'm doing is leaving a few like open areas. I want to leave a few open areas like that. Okay, next I'm going to take my silver and I've got it opened all the way and I'm going to go in here and fill those empty spaces where there's no white. I, I love coming up with new techniques um, for Liquid Sculpey. Liquid Sculpey is, is my favorite product. Um, Primo is my second favorite product, but I just love Liquid Sculpey. And I love um, doing the mad sciencing to figure out how do you make this look like that and, and how, how to best use it. And so I love coming up with new techniques all the time. Okay, so there is the white and the silver. And that's all we're going to add for now. Now, the first thing I like to do is I like to tip it. And what that does is it gets the liquids moving into each other. And it kind of helps blur the line between the harsh white and the silver edge. And it also helps you carry the liquid all the way to the edges of your dish. Okay. So I'm just tipping it different directions to make sure it's it's filling out the level. Okay, now I wanna quickly show you, I'm gonna show you a little technique that comes out more like this. And then I'll show you a technique that made it look like this. So if you want something to look more um, like a, maybe like a homemade paper look, you can just take a needle tool and swirl it through the different colors. And that looks super pretty. And you could add more colors and you can go different directions to compound your design. So that's one look that's just, you know, so easy. But the way I achieved this more of a natural marble pattern is with my fingertip. And what I did was I pushed down through the liquid and I kind of pushed it around. And then I moved my finger over and did it again. And so what you're doing is kind of smashing through those liquids and making thin spots and thick spots and letting um, the colors randomly reconfigure themselves. And that looks more like natural marble. And as you pick your finger up, um, you'll get these fantastic little drips coming off that will also help make it look more marbled. So it just depends on how you want it to look. If you want it to look supernatural or, and by supernatural, I mean really natural, <laughs> or if you want it to look, you know, more, more um, constructed, you can do either one. Now my fingertip kind of created some bumps in there. Um, so I want to just go back through here and tap it again. So there's, there's the super marbled look. This is the one I already have baked. So they came out, you know, pretty, pretty much the same. Now I wanted to add um, some gold highlights into my marble just to kind of bring the gold color back in. So I'm hoping I have um, some gold here that I can get out of the bottle. I hope I didn't use it all. Um, actually, I have another bottle of gold. Maybe I'll just use it because. So what you want to do now is you want to apply the some gold here in really thin, really, really thin lines. If you're scared about how it's gonna end up there, what you can do is just use your work surface to practice. I do that a lot. I just think, oh, okay, that's thin enough. I can deal with that. I The worst thing is just to go right to your art and have it just blop out. So if you kind of take your time and get a feel for how thickly it's running that you'll be really happy that you did. And so I'm just adding some random, very thin lines in different directions of the gold. I'm keeping it as skinny as possible. You'll be super happy if you can keep it really, really minimal, okay? Now what you wanna do is take your needle tool and I'm gonna dip it into the gold 
in the middle of the gold line. This gold line is about that long between my fingers. So I've got it right in the middle and I'm just dragging it only in the gold. And then when I get out here to the outer edge, it's gonna keep pulling gold into these very, very thin points. And I'm gonna do that on both ends. And it look, makes it look, brings it to this like impossibly thin gold tail, which is what I'm going for. I, what I'm trying to get is like a vein look that that natural marble would have. So I'm only letting it follow the gold and then pulling it through the other colors super thinly. Now, if you get an accumulation of the other colors on your needle tool, you really need to wipe that off so that it doesn't, um, you know, confuse your, your design. Here's another one over here. And here's another thing you can do. You could actually start in here where there's a lot of gold and pull it out the side and you could create, you know, more of a vein look. So just something to experiment with. Okay, so there's my, my gold veining that I added. Here's the one that's already baked. So this one needs to be baked again, following the baking instructions for liquid Sculpey to set that up. Now this time you don't need to bake that on the, on the, on the wet towel. You can just put it right on the baking pan because it's already cured. Okay, it needs yes. okay, so on to rings. Let me clean up my little liquid mess here. On to rings. We got a lot of ring <laughs> styles to make. Let's look at the ring styles that we actually have. This one is a Natasha ring or a mirror image. This, these ones are, what do we call this, Jen? Squiggle rings. Squiggle rings. So let's just group them. These are all Natasha because we really don't have as many rings here as you might think. These are all striped, 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 and these are twisted. So super easy stuff. Um, here's a great way to come up with a ring form. So if you have um, any little circle cutters, you might just try those on for size. This circle cutter, which is I think three quarters of an inch, fits my ring finger perfectly. If you have other circle cutters that might fit your middle or your index, go for that. If not, you could make some paper tubes out of, this is out, made out of manila folder. I just measured my, my finger size, cut strips of vanilla and then taped them so that they would be you know, the same diameter as my finger. And so those are taped together. Now I wanna show you another tip that I have. And that is whether you're working on these manila, uh, whether you're working on a cardstock form or even on these metal forms, these metal cutters, you wanna cover whatever your form is with some scotch tape or some um, gift wrapping tape. The gift wrapping tape helps the clay not just stick on there so much that it's hard to get off. So I'm gonna coat both of these with um, some tape and this one's already done. So now let's take a look at making this twisted ring. This one, um, I actually just made the twist flat and this one is very round. So what we can do is take some of our leftover Heshi bead uh, here, or you could take, you know, different colors of gold and navy and igloo. That's actually um, galaxy glitter is the one. And just make sure that your clay is, you know, long enough to go around your finger. And then to make this look, what I did was flatten it with my finger. And then what I did was I go back and I kind of press the edges down flat so that it sits nicely on my finger. And then I kind of smooth the top again. My edges aren't quite straight. So if I put some pressure on the edges with a blade, that will bring those back into alignment. Okay, now just pull that up and cut yourself a straight edge on one end. And then you wanna wrap this around your form and we, this already has the tape, the gift wrapping tape on there. So I know it's not gonna stick too bad. And then when you get to the back edge, here's how it looks from the top. You just wanna trim this and I'm, I'm doing straight cuts. And then you wanna join those two together and blend that seam with your fingertips. Now both Primo and Souffle are super duper strong. So they are really, really good for making this ring project. Um, 
it actually takes quite a bit of hand pressure to get this ring off the form after it's baked. And so you need the stronger clays like Primo and Souffle um, to hold their shape and to make a ring that you can actually wear. Now, I once again have bulged out the edges of my ring shape, so I'm tucking it back in with this straight blade. Okay, so that one's ready to go in the oven. You bake it right on the form and following the baking instructions for souffle or for primo. All right, let's do another design. Um, let's do let's do this squiggle ring. Um, and I'm gonna take some of my, uh, this is 18 karat gold. And what you wanna do first is roll out a really long rope of conditioned clay. And then we're just gonna form that squiggle. So you wanna condition this really well. Some of the pieces are quite thin and that's just a whole nother reason why you want to focus this type of project on either Primo Sculpey or, or Souffle Sculpey. All right, that's conditioned well and I'm just gonna get it going into a long, long rope. You could also use an extruder at this point to make yourself a long, long rope if you want to. However you like to do it. I kind of like rolling, I kind of like rolling my ropes by hand. I've been doing this for a long, long time. So I've finally mastered the art of rolling long, long, even ropes. <laughs> and so that's the way I like to do it. All right, I'm trying to make sure my rope is like the same diameter, the full length. And then what I'm gonna do, I think in my written instructions, which you can download from sculpey.com, um, I think in my written instructions, I told you how long this has to be. So what I'm gonna do is fold the rope in the middle, and then I'm just gonna zig and zag back and forth, making these little squiggles and trying to keep your squiggles of even height each time. And I am putting pressure on my each new squiggle to make sure it's connecting to the one before. So good construction practice will help you make things like this that actually are wearable. And what I mean by that is that these little squiggles have to be in good contact with each other so that they don't spread open and break. Same with that seam I did at the end of the, the marbled ring. You want that seam to be really finished well and making good contact. The clay is, you know, making good contact, so. And you just wanna keep going and going. And this one is the same ring, but I did it with um, a marbled stripe of clay and it came out, you know, totally different. This one is um, made out of, entirely out of souffle um, in the sea glass color. And it looks totally different too, because souffle has that matte look. And this one is Primo anti or 18 karat gold, just like I'm doing here. And it has um, the mica trails in it, which are beautiful when it's baked. So, all right, just making sure everyone is touching side to side and it's gonna be you know nice and uniform. This time I'll show you how to do it on a paper tube. Believe it or not, this paper tube can go right in the oven. And that is a bonus. You can bake paper um, in a 275 degree oven, no problem, because paper won't ignite until over 400 degrees. So paper tubes, cardstock, those are all fair game um, for making, you know, things like this on a form. All right, so now what I want to do is just um, trim this, and I'm going to hold it out on my finger and trim it. I'm just eyeballing where it's going to meet, and over here I'm going to trim this one off so that my ring meets on the down squiggle. <laughs> that little arch right there is where they're gonna meet. And it makes a complete um, squiggle ring. So at the end there, you can kind of cheat your squiggles a little bit so that they line up perfectly. And that one is ready to go in the oven. No worries, it won't burn. Bake it at 275 
for about 30 minutes, just like you would any other Primo, and then you can take it off your form. All right, let's look at this type of ring real quick. This is called a mirror image pattern because everywhere you look, um, it's symmetrical down the middle and it's mirrored sort of like, sort of like wallpaper. Um, I made those two first and then Jen really liked this really tiny one. And so I'll just show you how it's done and then you can, you know, process your clay to make, um, to make the patterns. So we wanna start with, here, I'll just use this scrap of the squiggle and I'll use some of this scrap of a marbled piece. And I'm gonna also use some of this twinkle twinkle because that will really add some depth um, these types of mirror image pieces, they look really good made out of scraps. And so I'm kind of concocting some scrap here is what I'm doing. But if you have wads of scrap sitting on your workstation that you don't know what to do with, this mirror image or Natasha bead process is really good. So I've got my clays going and I'm just gonna twist them. Get them interacting with each other in a random way. Okay, and then I'm going to fold it and fold it and do it one more time. So I'm creating layers and layers of those colors in a very random way. Okay, twist and twist. That's really pretty by itself. That would make a really nice one of these. <laughs> I like that. Okay, now what I wanna do is I'm gonna push this into a fatter log because it's just easier to deal with, okay? Pushing the insides toward each other to make it fatter and squattier. Okay, now what I wanna do is I'm gonna cut this in half right down the middle of the log. Okay, and now when you open this, it's completely gonna give you a mirror image pattern. You wanna open it up and line it right back up mirror to mirror, left to right. And it makes a completely symmetrical. Can you see how cool that is? I love that one. That's really good. <laughs> I like that one. Um, everywhere you look all the way down is that mirror image, okay? And then to finish it, you wanna make sure that your seam is coming back together in the middle. So I'm just using a little finger pressure here, okay? And this is way too thick for um, a ring. So what I wanna do is flatten it out a bit. I'm just gonna flatten it with a little roller and stretch it a bit. And that pattern will just stretch right with it because you want your ring to be comfortable to wear. Some of these rings I made, honestly, um, aren't so comfortable because they're so thick and they kind of spread your fingers apart. But you know what? That's all part of the learning. <laughs> That's how it works when we're doing art, when we're doing crafts. You got to learn. You got to learn what you like. But that is so pretty. Okay. I like it wide like this because I think you can see what's going on. But if you wanted to reduce this to a really narrow pattern, what you would want to do is just actually cut away the outside edge and on both sides, and then you could create a super narrow ring like this one. Hey, Amy, yes. what if you wanted to make a bracelet? Can you talk about some forms that people might be able to use? Yes, so great forms for bracelets. Well, first let's say, I'm just gonna keep making this ring yeah. while we're talking. So I'm gonna trim the edge and wrap it around one of my forms. Okay, because oven bake clays cure at 275, and this, this doesn't have any tape on it, um, they cure at 275. That is actually quite low temperature. You can't even bake cookies at 275. But um, glass, metal, paper, cardboard, cardstock, those can all go in a 275 oven. So what I do for forms is I save glass drinking bottles. I have, when I happen upon a glass drinking bottle that looks like it's about the right size for a wrist, I save it. And the industry standard in jewelry making for women's jewelry is seven inch diameter for a wrist. And then you work either direction from there, but the median is seven. So if you have a glass bottle that's about seven inches 
you know, not diameter, um, circumference. If you have a glass bottle that's about seven inches in, in circumference, save it and you can wrap, you could do a really big version of this and wrap it around a glass bottle and the clay won't bond to the glass at all. Um, it will just use it as a form. And then when it comes out of the oven, you can just pop it right off. So glass, metal, you can create, um, you can create forms out of cardboard or like cardboard, um, paper towel tubes, um, wrapping paper tubes, save those. You can probably get, get some use out of them. And if, if you're working with a paper tube, just coat it in some packing tape. That way your clay won't um, go into the porousness of the cardboard tube and the packing tape will make it pop right off. All right, how much time do I have, Jen? Four minutes. Four minutes, okay. Um, this one I think is pretty obvious. All I did was make bands of clay you know, pinched them together and then rolled them flat and wrapped that around my forms. I wanna show you, this one is already baked on my uh, scotch tape covered metal form. I have the, um, this end is, is folded over, that's the safety edge. So you wanna slide it off toward the cutting way. And so what I do is I just kind of start getting it loose like that. And then it just comes right off. And it comes off way easier with the tape than if you just wrapped it around, you know, the metal form itself. It doesn't bond to the metal, but the tape really helps release it. So if there's no other questions, maybe I better wish everyone well and tell them what's next. <laughs> what do you think, Jen? Yep. All right, Lindsay, let's go to my overhead camera or my front facing camera so I can wish my people well. Thank you so much for coming. I always appreciate having every single one of you in my class. We've got a lot of great Zoom and live classes coming up in the future. I don't remember what they are right now, but please, if you um, make anything using um, our Sculpey clays, please use the hashtag um, Sculpey if you're posting to social media and also hashtag um, how to use Sculpey. And also you can use the hashtag made it with Michaels or make it with Michaels and Michael's classes. And because we would love to be able to find what you've made and we would love to be inspired um, by your works as well as we're, we're trying to inspire you with ours. So thank you again for coming. <laughs> uh, Lindsay, do you have anything else? That's it. Um, okay. It's been recording. You'll see it up in a few days. Yeah, check it out and you can play it back at your own pace. And I'd love to see what you've made. So take care. Thanks for coming.